Hello, my name's Kevin Graham and welcome to my Celtic State of Mind. To my left, today we've got Paul John Dykes. Hello. And our guest today doing the soundtrack of his Celtic life is Celtic View editor Paul Cuddy. Moving on to memory number five of your Celtic soundtrack to your life. Memory number five, it's fast forward to 2002. And the game, it's, partly it's the game and then the season, so obviously it's the, the season of Seville. But the game I chose is actually the, the Basel away game. And the reason I chose that, I mean, effectively that is the start of the run to Seville because we'd won the, the home game 3-1. And I think when we scored the third goal, I think everybody thought, right, that was it. we'll get through. And I, I think sometimes fans in general are quite guilty of, see if you play a big team or a team you know, you think, well, that's going to be a right tough game. But see if it's like a team like Basel, it's like, you know, from a less glamorous country or less well, you just automatically, there's this presumption of, oh, we're going to win. But I think when we got to 3-1, I think we thought we'd do the job and we'd get into the Champions League again and because we'd had that taste of it for the first mm-hmm. time, I think we thought, right, this is going to happen again. And for the away game, uh, what, what used to happen at that point, I'd, I'd started working at Celtic in 2001 and at the time, it was Tony Hamilton used to do the commentary and on pre-season, he'd gone away in pre-season and one of the traditions of pre-season was the backroom staff and the kind of Celtic media would play the journalists at a, a bounce game just in, in the last day of training. Uh, so they played this game and somebody absolutely half Tony uh, and he broke his broke his leg and snapped his kneecap. It was a horrific, absolutely horrific injury. Um, there is footage of it somewhere. And it's it's actually it's a shocking. It's, I mean, it's right up there with the worst of Atletico Madrid. I mean, it was a really, really bad tackle. So... He was out Who of commission. Are you going to name him? Name and shame him. No, I can't. <laughs> was I can't, it men? <laughs> no, I can't, I can't name him. I would leave that for Tony if you ever if you ever get him on again. He he can be the one. But it was a terrible tackle. So he was out of commission basically. So as a result, I went to the game in Switzerland to do the commentary for the first time. And you know that way because as as we guys, you'd always watch the football and you're thinking. I mean, I know I, I know how to watch the game. It's a commentary. I've heard that a million times. I think I'll be fine. So I was doing the commentary and it was with Jonathan Gould and I felt in the first half like I was drowning because I hadn't realised it's physically impossible to keep up with the pace of the game and the ball so you can't mention every player. You just literally can't because the game moves too quickly. And I was absolutely floundering and Jonathan Gould, to his credit, I think realised so he would come in quite a lot and give quite good summaries just to, to give me a breather. And at half time I remember going down and... At that time, I was still smoking, so I went and had a cigarette and a cup of coffee, <laughs> and and was telling myself mentally, right, you just have to keep calm. You need to, and I was okay, a wee bit better in the second half. Although I've never listened back to it, but the game itself was, I mean, it was a it was a great wee. It, it took, I think, it took me by surprise as well. It was a, a really compact stadium. The atmosphere was brilliant. They had a really good support that really get behind their team. And on the night, I think it took us by surprise a wee bit. Although I still remember from our commentary position, I was standing. We were sitting right behind where Chris Sutton, he had a chance, a chance that just went the wrong point. side of the okay. post and we were right behind him and when he hit it, he thought it was going in and that would have taken us That would have taken us through. So obviously we don't and, and you know, the, the kind of, mm. the blow of that and then, but then subsequently what happens in the course of that season is just, I don't think anybody would swap it for anything apart from winning the final, obviously. Winning the final, eh? <laughs> there's that Sutton chance where there's a bit of footage with Martin O'Neill on the touchline watching it and he just ends up on his knees when Sutton bent it it looked it was going in all the way and somehow it just manages to go go on the outside of the post eh? and you're like that was it that was the you knew at that point that Aye. that was the because I, I always think of those t- the two seasons I always think of as that one I think it was a really good in terms of European experience well the previous one had allowed us to get into the Champions League so we got that experience that season it was a really good one for the team and they really proved they knew how to win home and away in Europe but we mm-hmm. get there all the final. It's the next season that to this day that game in, in Lyon where Bobo handles the ball. Nah, I, th- I genuinely think if we get th- into the knockout stages we'd have got to the quarters or semi-finals because that team knew how to win home and away. I mean Porto won that tournament that season. Mm-hmm. We knew how to do and I think that would have been our, our best chance of getting really far in that tournament. It's interesting because was it Neil Lennon or Chris Sutton said exactly the same back in January when we were chatting to them in Glasgow because we were talking about disappointment at the Seville season and they said actually the biggest disappointment was the following season because mm-hmm. they felt 
that they could have progressed. Oh, uh, absolutely. I'm not blowing name trumpet, but I've said that a couple of times as well. <laughs> you asked me to ask them that, Kevin, I and did. I, I failed to do so. So um, We were phenomenal that following season. We, the, we broke until Brendan's side we bought the undefeated record mm-hmm. we bet Barcelona there was almost a sense I, I, I got the sense as if obviously there was the disappointment of Seville but there was that real irritation that we hadn't actually got anything tangible mm-hmm. for what had been a great season so then the next season I think we blew everybody away but that inexplicable hand, handball in Leon just you, you look at teams like Berlin for me Bar are always a shining example of how a team from a small league in Europe can be successful in Europe, especially a couple of years ago. You always looked at the knockout stages, the, the Champions League. They used to get to the last 16. If they were in the Europa League, they were always in the quarterfinals, semi finals. Especially last couple of years under Celtic before Rodgers. I was going like that. Why can we not do what they're doing with far greater resources? I mean, I'm not sure if they are. I mean, you'd have to look back and see if they're coming in at the tournament at a later stage no, in us, young, for example. Young, boy, young boys are Bern. Oh, right, OK. Won the, won the Swiss League this year. Um, but you know, like in previous year. years, like Basel, maybe just over the years, having done well, it kind of boosted their, their coefficient. But they did have, there was a period they had, the, was it the Yakan brothers? The Yakan there was one at the brothers. back who was really solid, and then a wee guy in the middle who we, 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 always got we were always linked with. <laughs> Who was a really good, really good footballer, but they were a really good. And I th- they, although on a smaller scale in Celtic Park, I thought their, their home ground was a really advantage to them because they, their fans were right on top of the pitch mm. and they really got behind them. And your commentary career took an upward turn after that first, the, the debut against Basel. Aye, well, but I'll leave it others to judge that. But um, bizarrely enough, we um, have a there's, a there's a girl who's been in doing kind of work experience for us, like a placement. She just finished university, and it's actually Jonathan Gould's daughter. Who is really, you know, it's, I mean, she would have just been a wee girl at the time when he was he was a player and she, she has really fond memories of some of the players and things. But I did say to her, you know, next thing you're speaking to your dad, just thank him because he really, he really rescued me that night and it was, uh, you know, to his eternal credit. And when you think back to that period of your, your life and your Celtic support and career, Paul, what music takes you back? Well, that, again, this is this is getting to the point now where it, it became more difficult because I don't really listen to a lot of modern music, so it's hard to you know to to put something at the same time. But so I looked at the songs from around. It was actually two thousand and three, and the song is is Evan, Evanescence. I don't even know if I can say that right. And it's uh, Bring Me to Life. And the reason I chose that was uh, my daughters uh, were right into to that band, particularly my older daughter Louise. So I think. There's just over four years gap between her and Rebecca, so I think because Louise was right into the the music, and so Rebecca, because it was her big sister, she obviously follows her musical mm-hmm. taste, and they played at the I think at the time it was the Carling Academy just in the Gorbals, mm-hmm. so uh, they wanted to go. So the, Louise would have been about fifteen or sixteen, Rebecca was only about nine or ten, so I would got tickets for them, and I, I went, I took them because I thought they were still too young, particularly a venue like that where it's all standing. It'd been different; it'd been seats. So we went in, and it was kind of maybe a sign that they that they were just starting to get a bit older. So I, I just stood up at the bar and then just left. It. Louise took her, her, her wee sister, and they went down into the the kind of body of of the crowd, and I kind of could still keep an eye on them. But they kind of felt it was almost like I think for them, particularly Rebecca, it was like she was at a concert with her big sister and without parental supervision. Although I, I was still keeping an eye on them, so, and it was that was quite nice. And they were they were actually really good live as well. But that was kind of more for them, so that because that was of the time, that that's the reason I chose that song.
Number six. Number six. The one that I chose um, for a whole variety of reasons, it was it won in the title in 2008 at Tanadice. Obviously that was the, th- the third of the three in a row under Gordon Strachan, but the reason I chose it was obviously just for the emotion of, of that time with Tommy Burns dying and then us having to go and, and play that game, you know, when everything was still pretty raw. And um, I mean, I think obviously for everyone, I think as supporters, but obviously within the club, you kind of got to, to know him and you, knew, you know, he was always about the park and always about the stadium up at Lennox Town. So it was a real, I think, a big shock for everyone. Um, and it was only when they had a, the Celtic Grave Society had an event just to mark the tenth anniversary, and I, I was lucky enough. I was asked to say a few words, and, and and actually, when I was thinking about what to say, it struck me that I'm the same age now as as Tommy was when he passed away. And suddenly, you think it just reinforces the fact that he's still a young man. So obviously, that was a really emotional time, and then everything that had been going on with it didn't really look as if we were going to win mm-hmm. the, the league with too many games. There was, you know. We couldn't afford any slip-ups, but obviously it gets to that last game at Tanadice. And I actually just went to the game that night as a fan. I think Tony Hamilton was doing the commentary. So I just went up to the game uh, with my wife. And again, it was a, you know, it was a, a tense game. I still, th- I still felt we, we always thought we were going to win it. Obviously, we, it was quite late on before uh, Benny Gouda Hesselink got the, the I th- header. I think we had the momentum. I think the momentum had switched. Yeah, and it was just kind of sense as if, you know, that, it was it was fated that we were going to win, um, and so obviously, you know, it was an emotional night. And it, subsequently, I ended up. Uh, it was about a year later being asked to write Tommy's biography, which was was pretty daunting task, um, because he was obviously he was he was a hero of mine and everybody else has grown up. But then, because he's such this iconic figure, there's a lot of pressure on you. To I mean, you know yourself, Paul. When any time when you're asked to write a book about a, you know, an individual. There's a lot of pressure on you because you've got to. You're telling the story, and you want to tell it to the best of your ability. But you know that people who maybe would know the person better or more intimately are going to read it, and you just want their seal of approval as well. And so that was a real, a real challenge. But you know, it's it's one of the the highlights, as it were, of of my whole time at Celtic was was being able to to write that book and getting to. Particularly getting to speak to his his family, uh, to Rosemary and the kids, and they all came in individually, and you know, we did interviews at Celtic Park, and just the kind of the honesty and the way they spoke about their dad, and you know, the, the, it was obviously still really raw for them. I mean, that was a real, quite humbling, and um, so as I say, that's when I always think back to that time. I always think that that's the reason why I would chose that mm-hmm. one, and it would. Feel like a huge sense of responsibility, particularly Definitely. when you're dealing with the family. I know a lot of people do the biographies and they're doing it just off their own back, but if there's family involvement, you feel a real pressure. Go back to that Thursday night at uh, Tanadice. Mm-hmm. Now, it is said that the league season wasn't extended that year. If you ever speak to any Rangers fan, they'll tell you, Oh, we got to the EFA Cup final and that league season was never extended. Has anybody else in this room? Heard the league finishing on a Thursday night. I mean, I think because obviously the gate it was that was the same year as, as Phil, yeah, mm-hmm. O'Donnell. Had, I mean, that was one of the reasons as well that the fixtures piled up. I mean, it was a pretty that was a hard hard season for Celtic fans. I remember the when we look at how pivotal Scott Brown is for us now, but the change in, in that season was Gordon Stratton dropping him and bringing in Barry Robson and Paul Hartley together in the middle of that park but I think Hartley and Robson got us over that line because I think we had to win the final eight games or mm-hmm. we couldn't drop any points and I think it was they two that really dragged us by the scruff of the neck across that line I always had a I mean I always thought so somebody like Barry Robson who you know there's always players that just give you absolutely everything because like, there's only one way he can play I'm guessing he played the same way at training but I always remember and I, again, some some of it for me is like maybe what, one of the problems of, of Scottish football. So you would get somebody like Aidan McGeady who could do things with a ball that other people couldn't even dream of. And sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. That's the nature of, of a winger, any winger in the world. I mean, Messi doesn't run past everybody every time he gets the, somebody to take the ball off him. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying McGeady's at that level, but 
what sometimes used to irritate me is like he was Celtic wingers. It must be the hardest position I think to play at Celtic because they're the guys that people are always on their back because if they don't do it every time, and I think I spoke to older fans who. You know, there wasn't universal acclaim all the time for Jinky because he didn't beat everybody every time. But obviously, the, the, you know, with the passage of time, the, the kind of, that's forgotten about. But sometimes it used to irritate me that, say, Magidi would try something and people would criticise him if he lost the ball. But then Barry Robson, he would get the ball and he would control it, but it would spin away five yards and he'd fly into a tackle to get it back and lose a foul. And everybody'd cheer and go, that's what you want. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know if that is what you want. And I think... The evolution of Celtic now under Brendan Rodgers in terms of, you know, somebody like Callum McGregor, people like James Forrest, and, the, and again, possession's king, and we, we, we use it, we use it well, but it's all about being able to control the ball and then pass it and move quickly. And that's not to, to criticise, because I, I, you're probably right, I think, for that title, we, what we needed was, maybe not the finesse, but we needed people, guys that just... Wanted to win and just whatever whatever it took, whatever it took, they would do it. And, and I think so. So credit, but there, it's due. There, there was a lot of leaders in that team, and there's a lot of guys that didn't get enough credit. Guys like Stephen McManus, Gary Caldwell. See, I think sometimes you know, likes of Caldwell and, and and McManus. I think sometimes I think particularly Gary Caldwell maybe suffered somewhat because again he, he was maybe trying to play maybe. The kind of football we're now used to the, the back having to play, mm-hmm. and, but again because of that, if you, if you make a mistake, you're going to get punished. But also, I think sometimes he was maybe seen as being one of Gordon Strachan's favourites, and sometimes that, you know, maybe that caused some criticism. But the two of them, I thought, were, were a decent central defensive pairing, and we definitely suffered in, in the latter half of Tony Mowbray's season when we kind of gutted that team, mm-hmm. and the two of them, two of them left. It was the a team- strange decision though, because it was basically what happened was it was a club captain and Scotland's Player of the Year. And Mowbray just didn't fancy them at all, and it took a long time after that for us to get a central um, defensive partnership. I felt after Caldwell McManus, probably right up to Van Dyke. Van Dyke, Van Dyke, Van Dyke yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean that season when you were, you were talking earlier on about you know, Phil O'Donnell dying, and I remember it was a few days after that, and we were we were starting to put together I think the Celtic view for the first one back, and some tributes to Phil. And it was I remember being up at Lennox Town and trying to get a few words with Tommy. Burns about it because he'd obviously brought Phil to Celtic and he was absolutely shattered because he'd come in and he said yeah I'll do it but he just went into his office for about 10 minutes and I think it was just that sense of disbelief that this young guy that he'd, kno- he'd known mm-hmm. was, was no longer there but um, so I think that I, I just I love that title f- because it, it obviously makes you think of Tommy So what's your track? Well again it's the song's not oh, of that era I couldn't even tell you what was playing in 2008 <laughs> but um, the Fields of Athen Rye, uh, that would have been one of the songs that would have been playing in the car, either get up the way or back down the road, and probably one of the ones that I could choose for the podcast. <laughs> 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 they, wouldn't, they wouldn't get me from any, that compilation. Yeah, right? wouldn't, wouldn't get me any trouble at work. Um, but I, I absolutely uh, love the Fields of Athen Rye, Paddy Riley's song, and I first heard it uh, years and years ago, about 1983, 84. And uh, a girl always got out with it at the time. Um, came from a big Irish family, so we used to go a whole big crowd of us. There was a Clyder club over on the south side of Glasgow. And we used to go there quite often on a Saturday night. And when the band were having a break, they'd get some people up to sing. So one of the the guys was just the same age as me. He would go up. He was a great singer. And the first time he went up, a guy called Neil Brennan, and he sang "The Fields of Athen Rye." And I, I thought, a it was my pal singing it. But then I thought, my God, what a great song. Um, and then I used to steal it, so I stole that as a, a party piece. So that that I love it for that reason. I sang it at my wedding as well. And then obviously I, I just was at the game that night with my wife. and So it, it reminds me, it, it gives me so many great memories. So that, that would be why I'd always want to choose that as one of, my, one of my songs. When were you introduced to the field? I remember it quite vividly. It was later than that. It was about 1990. My mum had gone to knock and came back with a wee cassette and it wasn't a Paddy Riley, it was someone known singing it and that was the first time I ever heard it in 1990. For me, it would have been when the Celtic support adopted it. Um, I can't remember hearing it. I just love the fact that that we sing it. And then Mm -hmm. when I learned to play the guitar and it was with, I mean, I was too old to have any aspirations to be a pop or rock star. That had gone, but basically I wanted 
especially when the kids were wee. She didn't go out a lot. She'd often have like, parties in the house, family parties. So it just wanted to get a sing song going. And that's always the song that I start with because everybody knows it and everybody loves it. And then it also reminds me of my father in law, God rest him, because I would invariably start playing it and he'd tell me to speed it up because I wasn't playing it fast enough. So, <laughs> uh, But that always gets this. And as soon as you start playing that, everybody, everybody sings a song. And then from that point on, that's it. The party's in full flow. Can it's Paddy Riley's version that you prefer, is it? It is, yeah. You can't beat Paddy Riley's version. I think because that's the one after I'd heard my pal singing this and I, I, I got it. I've still got it somewhere I think in the garage of, of like a vinyl a Paddy Riley record it was for that reason because uh, I wanted that song so that's his version One of our earliest podcasts was with Chris Morris and he claims it was him that introduced it to the Celtic support so I don't know if that's true or not but he brought it back from Ireland um, right. from Niall Quinn Niall Quinn, Niall yeah. Quinn introduced it because Chris Morris used to go to Celtic supporters do's in the centenary season and um, one of the things that he had to do was sing a song at the end of the night and he used to say to the boys what are you doing Granty says just start singing Hail Hail and they'll all join in you don't even have to know the words but then when he was at uh, playing for Ireland Niall Quinn says he told him the story and Niall says no no I'll, I'll give you a song and he introduced them to the field so he right. started going round the CSCs and that was his party piece so he reckons it was around about that time late 80s early 90s that the Celtic fans started saying it. Well, listen, if he, if he wants to take credit for it, that's, that's <laughs> a, absolutely fine. Morris. <laughs> Ship lies waiting in the bay. Low lie the fields of Athenry, where once we watched the small free birds fly. It's so lonely round the fields of Athenry By a lonely prison wall I heard a young man calling Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free Against the famine and the crown I rebelled, they cut me down Now you must raise our child with dignity Though lie the fields of Athenry Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of Athenry Fallen 
As the prison ship sailed out against the sky For she lived in hope and pray For her love in Bodley Bay It's so lonely round the fields of Athenry Watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of Athenry So we're, we're moving into the seven in a row, the seventh song, the seventh memory. Seventh memory. I've brought it right up to date with the double treble and the day that we won, uh, we beat Motherwell. And partly f- the reason for that was, you know, I said earlier on, the centenary season's my favourite of our day as a Celtic fan. And, and that, the day when we, we made it the double treble, that, that runs at a close second, primarily because uh, I got on the bus, the open top bus that went back from Hamden to Celtic Park. And it's just like one of the greatest thrills of my life because I never thought, first of all, I never thought I'd see the day that we would be allowed an open top bus through any part of Glasgow. I just never thought. And the closest, one of the many things that still irritates me about Seville, about not winning, is that was probably the closest we'd have got because there was a wee group we were planning within the club of what we would do if we won and we were going to be allowed, I think it was from the city centre actually, out through the Gallagate. So that would have been. And you know that way you just think there's no way Glasgow would have allowed it, but because it was such a monumental achievement, so that we lost out in that. So I just never thought I'd see it. So for us to be given permission to to have this open top bus if we won the, the, the treble again, you know, the first team ever in Scottish football history to do it, was incredible. And it was I think it was the Wednesday or Thursday before the final. Then uh, there'd been a kind of planning meeting at Hamden, and uh, our boss had come back and. She was saying, obviously, the social media guy was going to be on and one of the guys who's, who was doing some filming for one of the DVDs they're going to bring out, he was on, and then she said, and, and Paul, you'll be on. And I'm thinking, what am I going on for? And uh, what happened was they were going to do a live, as the, as the bus was coming back, basically, from Delmarnock Station, then they were going to do a, it's kind of a live sort of show, as it were, for all the fans at Celtic Park and then cut on the bus. So I was to do all the, the kind of quick interviews on the top deck of the bus so it was I mean obviously first and foremost you want to win the game that was brilliant commentating in the game with Tom Boyd and again it's like it's one of the great thrills of he does a lot of the commentary for Celtic TV and you get to know him and then you're talking to him and you're chatting to him about various things but most games I'll always look around and think he's the captain of the team that stopped the 10 and I'm sitting beside him commentating in football and you just think that's just amazing I can't believe that that's happening so that all that happened I bumped into my pal after the game who had gone to the Centenary Cup final and it was just like for those two minutes it was just brilliant the two of us reminiscing but then getting on the bus and it was just I can't tell you how amazing it was because although they, they told the fans to start congregating from Dunmarnock Station and all that way up the Clyde Gateway was just incredible the, the bus obviously as soon as it leaves Hamden and there's just some fans, and as soon as they see the bus and they're all jumping up and down, then the traffic's so busy, so it's ground to, uh, to halt. Cars, horns are tooting, everybody's jumping. It was just like, you know, that whole Glasgow's green and white. It just felt like this is our city. And even like occasion, the occasional Rangers fan who would appear at his, his house <laughs> and maybe gesture or shout something, that just added to the whole joy of the day because it just made it funnier. But it was just brilliant. And then as soon as we got to, to that Domarnock station and then the crowd was just... Incredible, and I was, having, was doing all these wee interviews with some of the players, but all the time thinking, I can't believe I'm on top of this bus, and it was just, it was, um, it was absolutely incredible. I, I, I just, I, it was, it was just amazing. You see the the iconic images of the past, and and you know when they paraded the European Cup in Celtic Park, and the, the images are captured forever. So in fifty years or a hundred years, you're there, you're on there, you know. Yeah, is that the the greatest moment in your Celtic? 
career being employed by the club? It's it's one of the, the greatest moments. Before that, actually, the, the moment I used to always choose was the year Mark, when Martin O'Neill left. So obviously, the, it was the Tuesday or Wednesday after the cup final, and obviously we'd we'd lost the league at, at Far Park. That was just heartbreaking. And then Martin announces that he's leaving, and that's that's devastating as well because he was just he was just amazing. He particularly for us, it was his magazine. And you work for him, and so he, he was. He took a real interest in it, and so supportive. And if he ever did anything, he wasn't happy about. It. He was. He was quick to tell you, but I loved that. But so the Tuesday, or Wednesday after it, uh, after the cup final, and he'd he'd obviously come in round the park to tell to say goodbye to everybody. So he came into our office, and he sat down and had a cup of coffee, and he sat for about an hour, telling stories of working under Brian Clough telling stories of things that happened over the last five years that we didn't know about. And it was just amazing. I mean, I don't think Halle MDL spoke. It was just like listening to him and all. So I remember going home that night and saying to my wife, that was just like one of the best days ever because I know, I just know every Celtic fan would have loved to have been sitting in that room listening to Martin O'Neill. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's things like that. that you, and you should never, you never want to take those things for granted because I, I just know that every other Celtic fan would love to be doing what we're doing. And so... Being on the bus, I just know that every other Celtic fan would have loved to be on that. I mean, to, to be there, to see the bus was amazing, but to actually be on top of it was just... And you just kept looking round thinking, this is just... It's actually beyond belief. I just... I love the fact that I was on it. Even though probably people, some people... I've been mistaken on occasion for Stevie Woods, so probably people will look <laughs> at it and go, what's, what's Stevie Woods doing some interviews for? But I don't care. I know I was there. Fantastic, that takes us up to just a matter of months ago And what song would you relate to that memory? Well, the song I chose was probably, I think it came out about two or three years ago And I had to have, in any any music list, I have to have Duran Duran I love Duran Duran, it's like one of, you know, from back in the day, in the 80s And, and Tony Hamilton and I quite often go to the games together And we'll either have the radio on or I'll put an I, the iPod playlist on And, and that's say something like Duran Duran or something else will come on and it takes us back to when we were just teenagers so I, I absolutely love them and and I, I do think it's possible I was speaking to a friend of mine just ahead of this and I was saying to her that I think you know you can have like Catholic music taste with a small C so I think even from the 80s it's possible I know not everybody would agree that it's possible to like the Smiths and Duran Duran now probably at the time it was that was sacrilege right it was like how was how that possible I think it is I think it's it's possible to like a whole range of things. But I do love Duran Duran. And actually, I, uh, about three or four years ago, I wrote a book of short stories. And all the, the, the stories that are inspired by Duran Duran song titles, everyone's a Duran Duran song title. And it's really, I mean, slightly tragic, but it's uh, a real passion of mine. So what I did is I chose, rather than one of the songs from back in the day when in the 80s, I chose one from the last album. Because I still think, I mean, I go and see them every time they, they come. They've never, they've never actually split up. They've had some band members have left, some have rejoined. But the last album, I think they did it with Mark Ronson, who is a massive Duran Duran fan, and he wanted. He, he's done it the last couple of albums, and he said he wanted them to kind of recapture that real nineteen eighties feel. So the the last album they had was an album called Paper Gods, and one of the singles was Pressure Off, and it's a brilliant song. So I have to have Duran Duran. I don't really know if it's got any link at all to the double treble, but yeah, I, I love the song anyway. The single's got um, Nile Rodgers on it, eh? Yeah, well, it's funny because uh, Nile Rodgers, he's been involved with them for years and years, yeah. I think from the Notorious album, which was about the third or fourth album. And he now, Nile Rodgers calls Duran Duran his other band. And I went to see Sheik. I think Sheik and Nile Rodgers are just one of the greatest. In fact, it's, I went to see Sheik last year at the Kelvin Grove bandstand, and it's the best gig I've ever been at. I mean, I think it's hard to have a bad gig at the bandstand. I think it's a brilliant wee venue. But they were just amazing. And quite apart from their own songs, the song he's written so many, you know, mm-hmm. Let's Dance, written some Duran Duran songs, songs for Sister Sledge, Madonna, you know, you name it. He's, you know, um, Daft Punk as well. Yeah, so he plays, I think he played, and he played again this year at Kelvin Grove Park, and it was notorious, the Duran Duran, but he's, he's a big, he plays on on the, the latest album so he's I actually bought tickets for that it was a two day festival and I actually bought bought the tickets just in the hope that Duran Duran would be, would be playing that weekend as part of the bill but no they weren't Still tomorrow Are we 
myself Just me, I couldn't be anyone else Is it bad when you're feeling this good? Are we all misunderstood? It's fine going out of my mind Going out of my mind Paul, thank you very much for being our special guest today and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed your Celtic soundtrack of your life. No, thanks for the invitation. Thank I've, you. I've loved it. Really thanks very much, it. Paul. Thank, thank you. you. Paul's colleague Tony Hamilton was also recently a very special guest of a Celtic state of mind and the Celtic FC Foundation are currently putting together one of their much-anticipated charity matches at Celtic Park. A Match for Cancer is a fantastic fundraising event which will take place on the 8th of September 2018 at 2pm. Excel Stylian Petrov and current Liverpool midfielder James Milner are pulling together opposing squads from the worlds of football and entertainment for what is sure to be another unforgettable day. James Milner's squad will be managed by current Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp and will include such players as Jason McAteer, Jamie Redknapp, Emil Heskey, Dirk Coit and Peter Crouch. Stan's team will be managed by our very own Brendan Rodgers and captain Scott Brown will be part of that squad alongside legends Henrik Larsson, Lubo Maravchik, Paddy McCourt, Arthur Boric, John Hartson, Tosh McKinley, Jackie McNamara, Simon Donnelly, Robbie Keane and Haristo Stoichkov. Now, as we all know, Stylian has bravely battled through leukaemia since being diagnosed in 2012 and every penny raised from this game will be split between the foundations of Stan, Celtic and James Milner. Celtic FC Foundation has confirmed that the first two cancer charities it will work with to make a positive difference to patients and their families are Glasgow Children's Hospital Charity and Beats and Cancer Charity. Tickets for a match for cancer are now on general sale from the ticket office and also online. They're priced at £14 for adults and just £6 for concessions. A Celtic State of Mind's previous episodes can be accessed by searching iTunes, Spreaker or your pre-installed podcast player. Make sure to subscribe and you won't miss our upcoming episodes with former players, musical icons, documentary makers and Celtic supporters. Tune in next week. We'll have another guest with a Celtic state of mind. 